Hello students. And now we shall look at uh, some university question papers on the subject environmental studies with a subject code 18 CIV 59. So this is for fifth semester. And here in uh, the multiple choice questions MCQs are being solved and also we will try to understand the concepts and Professor Suresh Mane and this effort has been coordinated by Professor Swati Kalgutkar also because we both teach this subject in this institution. So which of the following is not a prominent chemical responsible for good habitat. So you can see there are four options uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and nutrients. We have to name uh, which is which of the following is not a prominent chemical responsible for good habitat. So, when you solve such uh, uh, objective questions, so the best method is to uh, have the method of elimination. So, elimination means you keep eliminating one by one. Like for example, now uh, oxygen, let us say, oxygen is responsible for good uh, habitat, so that is not there. Then comes, you take uh, carbon dioxide, there is a uh, uh, carbon cycle and carbon dioxide also plays a role in that. So that is also not there. Then you will take sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is a pollutant. So it is not responsible for good habitat. Okay. That is sure. And the last one is nutrients. Nutrients are required for a good habitat. So if you go by eliminating, then you will find that only SO2 is remaining. So the answer should be the sulfur dioxide. So this is how you can solve. At high concentration, uh, concentration gaseous sulfur dioxide or oxides of sulfur can harm trees and plants by damaging foliage and decreasing growth. Sulfur dioxide and other sulfur oxide can contribute to acid rain uh, which can harm sensitive ecosystems. So the sulfur dioxide uh, you can see which is released by industries mainly by burning coal or even earlier diesel. So that goes in the smoke uh, to the uh, atmosphere and it mixes to form, uh, it mixes with the rain to form H2SO4 that is sulfuric acid and when it falls that is sulfuric acid basically, basically is harmful. So, sulfur dioxide is not a prominent chemical for responsible for good habitat. Second question, which of the following is a biotic component of an ecosystem? See, biotic means uh, living, okay? abiotic means non-living. In the ecosystem, you have both uh, biotic as well as abiotic component. So biotic means living. Now again we will try to eliminate here. Fungi definitely is a living organism. Sunlight is non-living. Temperature non-living. Humidity is non-living. So the answer is fungi. Let us see. Fungi. Okay. Good. The living components of ecosystem are called the Biotic components. Some of these factors include plants, animals, as well as fungi and bacteria. So, next we will go to the third question. The flow of energy in an ecosystem is, in an ecosystem there will be a flow of energy. So, whether it is bi-directional, it is cyclic, 
it is unidirectional or it is multidirectional so if you look at this it is not bidirectional it is not cyclic also it is not multidirectional also it is unidirectional the flow of energy in a ecosystem is said to be unidirectional because some energy is lost in the form of heat when moving from one tropic level to next thus each successive tropic level receives a less amount of energy as compared to the preceding tropic level you can see sun then the producers means grass this uh, plants and all they also release heat and then uh, they are primary consumers and you have decomposers so decomposers are the bacteria fungi so here you can see it is unidirectional the flow of energy in the ecosystem is unidirectional now coming to the fourth uh, question alternative eco friendly fuel for automobile seas so now automobiles like your cars motorcycles trucks they use petrol they use diesel they use cng they use kerosene kerosene was used earlier now it is not used it earlier it was used for cooking like in cook stoves so what is the alternative energy fuel now let us try to eliminate petrol is not alternate it is a regular fuel diesel also is a regular fuel kerosene also is a regular fuel not for uh, auto oils but for uh, domestic cooking so the only new uh, eco friendly fuel that is a gas that is a cng cng is compressed natural gas so cng is a fuel that can be used in place of gasoline diesel fuel and lpg that is liquefied petroleum gas cng is produced by compressing natural gas to less than 1% of its volume at standard atmospheric pressure so cng normally which is used uh, uh, in uh, automobiles it is almost at 200 to 250 bar pressure okay so it, as it is written here the volume is reduced to even less than 1% of its volume at atmospheric pressure uh, compressed natural gas is methane ch4 cng is nothing but methane and lpg is uh, a mixture of propane and butane lpg is a mixture of propane and butane cng is widely used in auto rickshaws uh, cars and buses that is basically in public transport it started in delhi then ahmedabad now mumbai for use in automobiles as fuel it is compressed to a pressure of 200 to 250 bars to enhance the vehicle on board storage capacity on board storage capacity means we have got limited space on the car or truck or bus so we will compress the uh, fuel so that we can hold more amount of fuel in less space when we are carrying that fuel because in see uh, transport vehicles the vehicle is carrying the fuel so that is called as on board storage now you can see a nice uh, image of uh, uh, cng tank in a car boot uh, this all this uh, we would like to acknowledge wikipedia we, all the uh, diagrams we are taken from the figures we are taken from the wikipedia and also the um, uh, content lot of content uh, explanation is taken from wikipedia or internet sources the uppermost layer of atmosphere is thermosphere exosphere mesosphere none of this so the upper most uh, layer of atmosphere is eco exosphere we will see that the exosphere is the highest and the top layer of earth's atmosphere it marks the edge of the space 
there are very few molecules in this layer the lightest atmospheric gases such as hydrogen and helium exist throughout the exosphere now you can see uh, this sketch you have got earth then first you have got troposphere troposphere after troposphere you have got stratosphere in the stratosphere you will find that uh, uh, ozone layer then on that next is mesosphere then there is thermosphere and last is exosphere next question uh, primary consumer is so in a food chain you have got consumers as well as producers so the question is what is the primary consumer so there are herbivores carnivores micro consumers and omnivores see herbivores means the uh, animals like goat sheep bullock uh, cow and all which eat grass okay these are called as grass uh, uh, herbivores carnivores are the animals which eat this uh, uh, animals like lion tiger leopard which eats this uh, uh, these smaller animals like tiger uh, they eat goat goat uh, sheep and then omnivores means which can eat both uh, grass as well as animals that is called omnivores like man he eats both vegetarian as well as non vegetarian food but the primary consumer is see primary producer is the grass or uh, trees and the then what uh, animals are dependent on this herbivores are dependent on the grass and uh, the, uh, the primary consumers uh, are nothing but herbivores because they depend on the primary producers so the answer is herbivores the organisms that eat the producers are the primary consumers so the producers are grass trees plants they tend to be small in size and there are many of them like i told goat and sheep their size size is small and there are lot of like rabbits the primary consumers are herbivores that is vegetarians you can see the food chain depicted so producer is a plant then primary consumer uh, rabbit then there is secondary consumer birds and then there is tertiary consumer this is one example of food chain so world environmental day is on so as you know uh, a uh, lot of uh, awareness is going on about environment in the world so the one day is fixed so which is that day so either 5th may 5th june 9th august or 9th june so it is 5th of june world environment day is celebrated on 5th june every year globally world environment day was established by the united nations general assembly in 1972 on the first day of the stockholm Con conference on the human environment resulting from discussions on the integration of human interactions and environment so realizing the importance of environment the united nation general assembly in 1972 declared 5th june as the world environment day because on that day in 1972 there was a general uh, uh, stockholm conference on human environment to commemorate that 5th june is celebrated world over as a world environment day <coughs> which of the following is not a part of hydrological cycle so you should know what is hydrological cycle hydrological cycle means uh, this water cycle so this water bodies uh, because of sunlight they they will evaporate form rains rain will fall down so this cycle is called as hydrological cycle so uh, where is precipitation infiltration transpiration and perspiration so let us see what are these things per precipitation means rainfall what is precipitating is called as precipitation that is rainfall it is a part of the hydrologic cycle the infiltration infiltration means when the rain falls on the ground then some of that will seep inside the earth that is known as infiltration that is a part of hydrological cycle 
then transpiration transpiration means this plants and uh, trees na they when they breathe they give out water vapors so that is known as transpiration that is also part of hydrological cycle then perspiration perspiration means when a person like animals man when he sweats that is known as perspiration this is not a part of hydrological cycle okay so the answer is perspiration water cycle is also called hydrological cycle is a process that involves the continuous circulation of water in the earth atmosphere system of the many processes involved in the water cycle the most important are evaporation transpiration condensation precipitation and runoff perspiration is also known as sweating is the production of fluids secreted by the sweat glands in the skin of mammals so you can see the hydrological cycle beautifully explained here so you have got water bodies and then uh, uh, there is evaporation because of sunlight okay then as they go up it condenses then forms clouds clouds become heavy to the left you can see black clouds heavy then there is precipitation that is rainfall then there is in the rainfall when it falls there is a infiltration which goes into the earth and there is some uh, runoff which comes back to the river and these plants take the water through the roots and there is uh, evaporation or transpiration from the plants so the next question is uh, the life zone of the earth is a atmosphere b hydrosphere c biosphere and d none again we will see uh, what is the life zone here by elimination atmosphere no hydrosphere no biosphere yes none no so by elimination again you are getting the answer as biosphere because bio means living organisms okay the so biosphere is what supports the life zone on earth atmosphere is a layer or a set of layers of gases surrounding a planet or other material body okay hydrosphere is a combined mass of water found on under and above the surface of a planet minor planet or natural satellite and biosphere is known as the ecosphere it is a worldwide sum of ecosystems so all the ecosystem like we have studied various ecosystem like grassland ecosystem forest ecosystems then desert ecosystem marine ecosystem na no? is all ecosystem puts together it is called as ecosphere it can be termed as a zone of life on the earth <clears throat> so you can see here uh this biosphere means uh, it contains this atmosphere which is air it contains hydrosphere that is water um, uh, marine uh, ecosystem then it contain lithosphere earth that is grassland or your forest ecosystem so all put together it is biosphere so that is a life zone on earth planet earth the 10th question eia can be expanded as so environmental and industrial act b environment and impact activities c environmental impact assessment and d environmentally important activity so uh, you can see here it is not a industrial act of course and it is not a, a impact activities it is c that is environmental impact assessment <coughs> this is a very good important term <coughs> eia environmental impact assessment so that whenever a new industry is going to be set up then the assessment is done as to after setting the industry what all harm or output it is going to give to the surrounding society and in what way like it will cause to cause air pollution pollution of water pollution of sound this all impacts on the atmosphere environment is studied and this is known as eia
Environmental impact assessment is the assessment of the environmental consequences, positive or negative, of the plan, policy or program. AI is designed to identify the potential risks of a project, that is infrastructure development such as dam, to the environmental or human well-being and identify measures to eliminate or minimize this risk. Even now the Skyga 4th and 5th, uh, sorry, 5th and 6th plants are coming up. So there is an environmental impact assessment has been done. Okay, for all power plants, dams, it is being done. Big, big industries. So EA is designed to identify the potential risk of a project. Okay, to environment and human well-being and identify measures to eliminate and or minimize these risks. This can be done by replacing and or modifying the planned activities to reduce the impacts. Okay, if any thing is causing a lot of harmful impact then there can be some measures to minimize the risk. Next question, eutrophication is an improved water quality, process in carbon cycle, accumulation of plant nutrients in water and none of this. See eutrophication again is a technical term. It clearly means accumulation of plant nutrients in water. Accumulation of plant nutrients in water. Eutrophication is the process where a body of water becomes overly enriched with minerals and nutrients which induce excessive growth of algae. This process may result in oxygen depletion of the water body after the bacterial degradation of the algae. You can see this color. This algae, na, green algae you can see. Water is blue but it is greenish means that is algae because of algae. Next question. Uh, effect of modern agriculture on soil is due to this uh, modern agriculture whatever you do, you do na, nowadays like uh, uh, flood irrigation, then use of tractors, then use of chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers and all. What it results? Uh, it results to erosion, that is soil erosion, then acidification, third is salinization and D, all of these. So you know that this modern agriculture has led to the erosion of soil, it has led to the acidification of soil and also salinization of the soil. So the answer is all of these. <coughs> Erosion is the displacement of the upper layer of the soil. Okay, that is also a form of soil degradation because the upper layer is very rich in nutrients. Then acidification is the natural process accelerated by agriculture. Soil acidifies because of the concentration of hydrogen ions in the soil increase. Because of the chemical fertilizers, the hydrogen ion increase and then it becomes acidic. Soil becomes acidic in nature. And salinization is the salt content in the soil. The process of increasing salt content is known as salinization. This is because of again urea and its chemical nutrients. Minamata episode of Japan is due to the poisoning of lead, B nickel, C mercury, D cadmium. This is a very famous episode in Japan. It was because of mercury. Okay, mercury poisoning. That Minamata is a place. Uh, <coughs> Minamata disease was first discovered in Minamata city in Kumamoto, Kumamoto Prefecture, Japan in 1956. This highly toxic chemical bioaccumulated in shellfish and fish in Minamata Bay and the Shiranoi Sea, which was eaten by the local populace resulted in mercury poisoning. So here in this uh, 1956 they found out that when by eating this shellfish and uh, fish in the which is caught in the Minamata Bay they found that uh, their local poisoning of people and they uh, were carrying mercury. Then they found out that the people when they were using the shellfish and fish that was carrying this uh, toxic, toxic chemical and people when they were eating then they were also showing this mercury poisoning symptoms. So mercury is a heavy metal and very harmful to the human beings. Fourteenth question. Percentage of fresh water available on earth is 
so earth you know is made of water three fourth water one fourth land but what is the fresh water which we can drink otherwise it is saline water lot of salt water is there in the oceans so the fresh water the answer is uh, options are a 2.8 percent b 2.2 percent c 0.6 percent and d 2.15 percent so the answer is 2.8 percent fresh water makes up to very small fraction of all water on the planet while nearly 70 percent of the world is covered by water only 2.5 to 2.8 percent of it is fresh the rest is saline and ocean based means it is having salt even then just 1 percent of a fresh water is easily accessible which with uh, with much of it trapped in glaciers and snow fields only 1 percent actually out of this 2.8 percent which is fresh only 1 percent is available and that also is a lot of uh, this water is in the uh, trapped in the form of glaciers and snow fields you can you have seen the antarctica arctic and antarctica na, there which of the following sector uses maximum quantity of water a agriculture b domestic use c recreation and fourth is d is animal husbandry so uh, uh, the answer is straight away agriculture because in household we use less water even recreation very little amount of water is used and mostly water is recycled animal husbandry means rearing of cattle like cow buffalo and all there also less water is used but mostly due to flood irrigation whatever you have seen lot of water is used by the agriculture sector india has 18 percent of the world population uh, having four percent of the world uh, fresh water out of which 80 percent is used in agriculture so just imagine uh, whatever fresh water is there 80 percent we are using only for agriculture india receives an average of 4000 billion cubic meters of precipitation that is rainfall every year however only 45 48 percent of it is used in india surface and groundwater bodies and the rest 52 goes to the ocean and becomes saline water wheat and rice production consume the greatest amount of water that is 80 percent of the total water use and the highest consuming states are uttar pradesh Punjab and Rajasthan, all in North India, accounted to 20%, 8.4 and 8.4% of the total water, Indian water consumption for cereal production. So basically, production of wheat and rice is very uh, water intensive and uh, it consumes a lot of water, almost 80% of the Indian water we are using for that and only three states like uh, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab and Rajasthan, they itself, uh, they consume around uh, 37%. More, more than one third of the water used in India for agriculture. The next question is maximum hardness, total hardness allowed in the drinking water is. See, drinking water has got a IS specification. Like Bureau of Indian Standards has set up st standards for water drinking, portable water also. Okay. So, what is the uh, uh, hardness allowed? 600 milligrams per liter, B, 1000 milligrams per liter. C 1500 milligrams per liter and D is 750 milligrams per liter. As per Bureau of Indian Standards, it is 600 milligrams per liter. So now we will see what is hard water and soft water. Water which does not produce lather means that foam with this when soap is used, then it is called as hard water. But which water which produces foam easily, then it is called as soft water. So if the water has got more hardness, it becomes hard water. Excessive concentration of fluoride in the water causes uh, dental and skeletal fluorosis, tooth decay, uh, methame, methame, methemoglobinemia and none of this. See here the very clear uh, indication is there. Fluoride means it causes fluorosis. Answer is A. Dental and excessive concentration of fluoride in water causes dental and skeletal fluorosis. Dental fluorosis is a condition that causes uh, changes in the appearance of tooth enamel. The tooth na, top portion is called enamel, white one. It may result when children regularly consume fluoride during the teeth forming years between uh, age 8 and younger. Skeletal fluorosis is a bone disease caused by excessive accumulation of fluoride leading to weakened bones. In advanced cases, skeletal fluorosis ca causes painful damage to bones and joints so you can see this uh, figures also 
this uh, white enamel it is looking yellow white is looking yellow so this is all dental fluorosis because of excessive fluoride okay even bones you can see bones are getting deformed because of excessive fluoride mineral is a an organic matter b synthetic compound c naturally occurring organic substance inorganic substance or d none of this above so here uh, mineral is naturally occurring inorganic substance a mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic solid with a definite chemical composition and ordered internal structure you can see a lot of minerals are shown here right from this uh, whatever you identify here uh, so many minerals are given here so these are naturally occurring inorganic solids uh, organic means which contain carbon inorganic means which do not contain carbon uh, 19th question is india is the largest uh, uh, world's largest producer of a mica b iron c coal and d copper so india is the world's leading producer of mica mica is naturally occurring mineral dust often used in makeup foundations as filler in cement and asphalt and a insulation material in electrical cable so this uh, mica if you have seen this uh, uh, your uh, iron box iron box they have got mica sheet inside okay so the mica sheet what it does it allows the heat to pass but it doesn't the current to pass so it is a good insulator for electricity and that is why used in uh, insulation for electrical cables also india is the world's largest producer and exporter of mica accounting for almost 60% of the net mica production in the world which it exports to united kingdom japan usa etc and andhra pradesh is the largest producer of mica in india nellore district of andhra pradesh is famous for mica production you can see this mica flakes even in your iron box that mica is like this only transparent color it looks transparent only like a small glass sheet like your what you call uh, on your mobile you are putting that uh, small uh, this na glass similar to that it is in the last question which of the following is not a renewable source of energy uh, solar energy biomass energy nuclear energy and biogas so again we will try to eliminate solar energy is a renewable source of energy biomass energy is a renewable source of energy uh, biogas is also nuclear so the answer is nuclear energy New, renewable energy is often referred to as clean energy comes from natural resources or processes that are constantly replenished for example sunlight or wind keep shining and blowing even if their availability depends on time and weather non renewable energy is a source of energy that will eventually run out like fossil fuels nuclear energy most of the most uh, sources of non renewable energy are fossil fuels such as coal oil and gas thank you i hope you enjoyed so these are 20 questions so we will have around 5 to 6 uh, videos like this each uh, having a uh, 20 questions in your annual exam you will have 40 questions to answer so we are answering 20 of them at one time okay thank you